Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. On this week's show, we're discussing the Chevy Camaro, which anonymous sources have claimed will be discontinued after the 2023 model year. If that happens, this would be the second time that GM has killed the Camaro. The decision isn't final, and there's a long time between now and then for GM to change its mind, so let's discuss whether or not it should. Joining me is MotorOne.com Managing Editor and Master Barbecuer, Brandon Turkus. How are you doing, Brandon? I'm, I'm a Master Barbecuer. Yes, <laughs> I wow. consider you. Since I barbecue uh, none whatsoever, uh, anyone who does even a little bit is a master in my mind. Also with us is MotorOne.com Senior Editor and Speed Eater, Greg Fink. How are you doing, Greg? Eating speedily as usual. Yes, I had dinner or I had lunch with you uh, today and was amazed that you ate yours about 100% quicker than I ate mine. Yeah, uh, if past lives exist, I definitely lived during the Depression and just knew when you had food, you had to <laughs> eat it and eat it quickly. <laughs> that, that is exactly what it felt like at lunch today. Um, all right, so let's talk about the biggest news this week by far, which is um, this uh, anonymous source that has claimed Chevy has no plans for the Camaro after two 2023. That can be interpreted a few different ways. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have decided it will be killed. However, when you don't put plans for a car in place, you know, um, starting about now, you know, it starts to look like you are planning not to continue with the car, either to discontinue it or put it on hiatus. You know, in, in other words, a replacement is not planned at this point. It caused a, a pretty big stir, but there's a lot to talk about here because why did they make this decision? And is it the right decision? Let me ask you first, Greg. I want to ask you first because you actually wrote uh, an op-ed today on MotorOne.com that we published with your opinion. So tell us, tell us what you wrote. I wrote about why Chevy should not kill the Camaro. Um, I should first admit, I'm a former 2015 Chevrolet Camaro owner, and that was the first of the new Camaros. I guess they call it the fifth gen. And it really wasn't that great, but it looked awesome. And at the time, you can get them really cheap. But the new one, or the current one, is fantastic. And my argument is it's the best muscle car you can get today, or pony car you can get today. It drives great. Its powertrains, minus that four-cylinder, are really solid. And even that four-cylinder, which is kind of a dog, the, power, the chassis is so good, you don't even really care about that four-cylinder that much. And I really like the ergonomics of it, even if the interior is really kind of low low grade. You and I have completely different perspectives on this because I think what makes these pony cars great is their designs, their images, um, and the impressions they give off. And I know that Mustang and Camaro have put tons of money and development resources into making them really great sports cars. Um, and that's great, and they, and, and they have succeeded. Um, and uh, I'd agree with you, maybe the Camaro more so than the Mustang. But I think the hard lesson Chevy has learned is that people don't, people buying these cars, and by these cars I mean specifically the Mustang, Camaro, and Challenger, they don't care about that. They care about the, um, the emotion, the emotional connection they have to the car and um, how they feel driving it um, and and what impression it gives to others. Um, it's that, and, and I think the the opposite of the Camaro situation is the Challenger situation, which is a car that doesn't handle like a sports car at all. It doesn't handle nearly as well as the other two, and it's 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 older. It hasn't been been redesigned. But uh, FCA and and Dodge have kind of struck on this this kind of. Um, fact about this audience is that it's more about the emotional connection and the impression the car gives than anything it can actually physically do. Um, yes, it, they do have to go fast and do all that, but that's more a, a number on the page. And, and there's no better evidence of that than the Hellcat, which is a monstrously huge number that made huge waves when it first came out. Um, and you know, what you can do with that number is <laughs> not very much uh, until they came the, you know, until the demon came out and, and they, they've made progress for sure. But it was really just about the, the impression of it, the fact that you had the most powerful car and that it looked amazing and nostalgic in a fresh way. Um, and I think that's where Chevy completely missed it. They, they went from having a really beautiful Camaro when it first came back 
and they they tweaked it a little, and then they really messed it up when they when they went to the sixth gen, and that kind of I think, you know, took the car out of um, out of the same group as the Mustang and the Challenger that have that emotional connection. It broke the emotional connection. I See, think. I feel like the current car looks so much like the fifth gen car. I know they did it this does. little facelift, and the SS one was really ugly with that flow tie grill, but they fixed that for 2020. And yeah, the fact it looks the same maybe is turning people off because they're like, oh, it looks like the old one, but Challenger's not struggling with that when it's looked the same for more than a decade now. That's because it looks amazing. It's a classic kind of timeless design they made and they've, they've, riff, they, they've, they've leaned on it uh, without fail and, and without messing with it ever since it, it, it came out. You can't do that with every design, but you can with this one. Sorry, Brandon, go ahead. What do you think? I mean, I think this is the Camaro is, and it, this is if this all comes to pass. I think it's going to be a victim of the same kind of uh, neglect and self sabotage that is kind of becoming a, a trend at at GM. This was a vehicle that clearly dominated the the pony car market when it first came out, and for a few years afterwards, and they neither did the took the Dodge approach of sticking with the design that people loved and making very, very small, modest tweaks while adding big name horsepower. But they also didn't take the Ford approach of saying, you know what, we're going to make something more evolutionary that appeals to a broad range of people. We're going to keep the price accessible. We're going to make the cabin really quite nice. It's the Camaro has kind of suffered because it has this shoddy cabin and now it has really questionable design, not because it's bad to drive. I think Greg's uh, opinion piece hit the nail on the head. This is a very good car to drive. It's easily the best of the three to drive, but Chevy hasn't been willing to do much of anything with it. It's it's done the very bare minimum. And when was the last is time that, you is heard that of- true, though? I mean, but they have they have produced progressively faster and more capable models. I mean, they haven't let it die on the vine. They've been making it better to drive. The 1LS, the... 1LE, you mean, and ZL1. The one they have the 1LE and they have the ZL1 and they have the ZL1 1LE, but where's the where's the statement-making car? Where's the one that says, you know, that says to the driver, this car will make you a badass? That's what the Hellcat does. It does it really well. It says to that person, to the driver that... I am the master of all that I see. I have all the horsepower, and I can make big, smoky burnouts. I'm, and I mean, that ZL11 LE, is the, I, not the look I'd necessarily want, but that giant wing, front and rear, kind of says, this car but means here's, But here's the thing. The, the giant wing is... Is it functional? Yes. Is it a cool thing? Look at the Challenger. I mean, the Challenger is a textbook example of how to appeal, how to, appeal to... I, I don't want to use this. I don't want this to be a negative connotation, but simple mindset like shiny things. It looks great and it has a whole bunch of power, and that's a very easy thing to sell. When you start t- talking about, well, it has a wing for rear downforce, and it has little winglets on the front for See, this front is, downforce, and we are we are you know we are targeting this lap time. Muscle car this, buyers don't care about yes. lap times. This is what John I was think. saying this earlier. This is why I think Ford got away with something that Chevy wasn't able to, because both Ford and Chevy started walking down the path of turning their pony cars into sports cars. And they succeeded. They made cars that went around tracks very fast. And the problem is, what you said, Brandon, this audience does not care about lap times. This audience cares about the bravado of the car and and these big, boisterous numbers. And maybe they care about quarter mile times, because that's kind of the... the um, the, the history of these cars. Um, the reason Ford was able to get away with that, of, of, of moving towards track times rather than quarter mile times, and Chevy wasn't, was because the Mustang's design still appealed emotionally to, um, to that audience. It was still nostalgic, it was still a Mustang. And I think that was true of the the early Camaro, the 2011 one, that, that looked so good. I mean, that was a concept car on wheels. But 
the 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 refresh it got after that was was a step in the wrong direction and then the redesign for the sixth generation was a complete break where there was no nostalgic emotional connection it just looked like a weird futuristic coupe it was just a blob of coupe i think it looks exactly the same as it did you know 2015 almost it looked like michael bay designed it for the transformers movie and chevy just borrowed that design for the actual car no i agree they, they, they did soften the edges with, you know, with like sandpaper and it does kind of make it look a little less exciting, but the core design features are still there. It's still like you look at it and you're not like, what is that car? It's clearly a Camaro. The front end was the problem. The front end was, the front end was awful. I dig the taillights. I dig the new taillights actually, but the, 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 everything from the firewall forward was just a mess. Last year, yeah, sales have been down, you know, basically since the, the current, sixth generation car came out but it still sold fifty one thousand units last year and it was still an ambassador for people that might be buying a chevy for the first time they they might be walking in and saying i'm going to buy this camaro and maybe 10 years from now i'm going to buy a cor buy a mid-engine corvette or maybe i'm going to buy a traverse to go for for my significant other to go with my Camaro and we can be a bow tie household. It was an ambassador of a car for that, for GM. And this is what I was talking about with the, the, the neglect and self-sabotage. I think they look at it as strictly an accounting thing of saying, well, this car only sold 51,000 units. Why are we, why are we allowing it to take up line space? Why are we doing these things when it only did this? And they're not looking at something that is less, uh, more intangible. It's also, I think if, if, if they did cancel it, I, I think you're right because, I mean, uh, Dodge kept the Challenger around when it was selling fewer than 50,000. It's because it serves other important needs as, 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 as image ambassadors of the brand and, and you know, gateways and aspirational vehicles. Um, I, uh, two points I'll make. One is that I don't think... I don't think they've decided to discontinue it at all. I think they want to... They, they are collecting feedback right now based on the response based on the response that the internet is having to this possibility that is going to inform their decision of whether or not they do this. And I would make the argument they shouldn't do it because there's plenty of time to turn this around. There's plenty of time to re-inject the, um, the emotion back into the car and to, to reconnect it to that fan base that should be buying it. They, can, they, have, they have old names they could fall back on like IROC and and Yanko and things like that. They can, you know, they, they can take a, basically a, a page out of the Challenger playbook and start having fun with the car and stop trying to chase a Mustang around a track. That was where I think they re- went wrong. And like I said, the only reason Ford has gotten away with this is because they've kind of done both the, 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 the Dodge um, strategy of maintaining that emotional and nostalgic connection and making just big brash horsepower versions of the car and they've also chased the Camaro around the track and just made the Mustang into a much better sports car. Um, I would just argue that their whole Chevy and Ford both doing that, spending the development dollars to make these cars like, you know, much better handling cars. And it, when, when I hear people compare the the Mustang to like the M3, I, 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 I shake my head. It's like, why does Ford is not going to get a buyer who was going to buy an M3 to buy a Mustang. They need to get every, every buyer who would ever consider buying a Camaro or a Challenger to buy a Mustang. They're it like w- wanting, wanting to swim with the German sharks in the, in the world of sports cars and Nürburgring lap times is, is folly. That's not how you sell more of these cars. Well, that might be the Chevy's problem is because it's got the Alpha platform underneath it, which is designed for Cadillac ATS CT4, whatever it's called nowadays. And that is a German seeking platform and it's probably another thing that kind of defines all of GM's problems. They have great products as far as dynamics go and somehow they just fall off the mark when it comes to the things that buyers are actually really looking for and this is kind of coming to get them now. We've had this conversation before when we talked about Cadillac a few podcast episodes ago where you know we we I think we all agree that the the CTS sedan and the ATS sedans are very good products but they just weren't what Cadillac's audience was asking for. Cadillac's audience was asking for crossovers and SUVs. 
and it served them the Escalade, which, it ha which customers happily bought, and a Dine on the Vine XT5 that they continued to buy, even though it wasn't even that competitive a product. I don't think anyone would say that GM doesn't make good products. They just many times make, make the good product in the wrong place. That is that is the infuriating thing about GM, and it's it's why that it's why I get so frustrated whenever we're talking about a uh, Cadillac or Chevrolet or GM as a whole. Is that these products are so good, and they just drop the ball on them, and it's 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 absolutely infuriating because you we know the company can make very good cars. They usually do, and it's they just, usually do. Like I said, it's it they they missed the mark because it wasn't the product that people were asking for. They made something good. It was just there wasn't the demand for it that that they thought. But the, even the when the demand's there, else. they do this. Like, you know, we recently, a few months back, compared the Chevrolet Traverse to the Honda Pilot. And the Traverse is very good in many ways. Its chassis is really good. Its powertrain solid. The interior is utter crap compared to the Honda. And it's just such a shame because they have these really good pieces. And then at the little things that people have to live with day in and day out, they're like, oh, we ran out of budget or whatever it is that makes them do these things. What all this leads me to believe is, so if Camaro leaves in 2023, I always kind of felt, I have no internal knowledge of this, but I always felt Camaro was there to kind of offset the Alpha platform for the Cadillac models. If Camaro leaves in 2023, are we saying goodbye to Alpha and possibly rear wheel drive? Cadillacs? It's not a sedan world anymore. Cadillacs shouldn't be obsessed over how good their sedans are. Um, they should be obsessed over how good their crossovers and SUVs are. And I'll again make the point that the best-selling Cadillac sedan is a front-wheel drive car anyway, the XTS. So yeah, they, maybe they should drop the rear-wheel drive platform from Cadillac. But it seems like you've invested in this very good platform. Everyone else has managed to turn their car platforms into crossovers. Why not create a crossover out of this that both appeals to the market and appeals to the enthusiast? Sure. I mean, that's what Ford's kind of doing with the Explorer, switching it to a rear-wheel drive platform for their crossover, which is really interesting. And I think if that were done in a luxury brand, there'd be a lot there'd, there'd be a lot more opportunity to make that like a driver's crossover. That's not what Ford's really done. But, um, but yeah, they, they could do that, but they're not. But the, the the problem it's it still comes back to that there there's this attitude at GM of, and we've seen it with we've seen it with Cadillac and I I've I've witnessed it and I've been told it multiple times by their staff not in so many words but the the messaging was there that they're selling what they want to sell they're not selling what they think that what the customers want they're selling what they want to sell and I I say this because. You know, for years and years and years, and this is a little bit of a tangent, so bear with me. For years and years and years, I have asked every time I've gone to a, a GM program, why are you isolating the active safety gear and the highest end trim and only selling it there and then charging a premium for it when you have all of these other automakers that are offering it standard? And the response was always the same. Our customers don't want that. Our customers aren't asking for that. And I, I don't think that that's the case. I think they're just using that as an excuse to say, you know, we don't believe in this. This is not the way we're going to do it. It's not going to fit with our strategy. And I feel like that has kind of trickled yeah. down to more of their products of saying, well, our customers don't want this. You know, our our this we, we know what our customers want. They, they make the mistake of thinking they know. And you, you can't. You can't know what the mob wants. You, when you look around your industry and your competitors start offering all these active safety features as standard equipment and you're not, like, clearly you should be following that trend. There's a reason they are. Um, they're selling more than you are. Like, like, like you, you, should, you should not stick to your guns and just say that's something they don't want. Of course people want more standard features. Um, that's that's ridiculous, and of course they feel ripped off if you're making if you're charging them for something that someone else is giving them standard. So but yeah, that's, that's, a that's, really... that's what they that's what they continue doing, and they 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 did it with the active safety. They they're doing it with Cadillac with the CT4 and CT5 that people aren't asking for, and and now it sounds like they, it's what what has happened to the Camaro is that it, it's it's a victim of that. It's not just a uh, it's not like a, the CT4 CT5 or the active safety where it's like a kind of a bad business decision it's it's a victim of a philosophy that has not served the company well so i want to get back to the camaro because i think the camaro and chevy do they, they do have um one consideration that the other two don't the, that ford and dodge don't uh which is the corvette 
Um, the Corvette is much closer to the Camaro than let's say the Ford GT is to the Mustang. And of course there really is no Dodge, uh, there's no Viper anymore. So there's no you know, big car above the, the Challenger. The Challenger can get as powerful as it wants. It's not gonna cannibalize sales. Um, but the, the Corvette is kind of right on top of the Camaro. So if you make an 800 horsepower Camaro, you've got to deal with what that means for the Corvette. And those are hard questions to, to, to answer for, for a company. That's the case for now. That's the case for now is, but they are, they're coming out with a mid-engine Corvette. We all know it's coming. Like they're, they're preparing to move that car up market. And doesn't that give Camaro even more breathing room to do something right. really crazy? I, like to I say think that, the future. you know, we have, we have the sports car. The Corvette is the American sports car. Sorry for GT, you're really cool. The Corvette is the American sports car. Why can't they turn around and say, you know, we have the American sports car and now we're building the American muscle car and take the fight to Dodge with a 900 horsepower car that does eight second quarters from the factory. I completely agree. That, to me, that would be the right product strategy. Not only that, it might give the Camaro more breathing room just for sales, even if they kept it as it is, because you got to imagine, and I'm totally, you know, just brainstorming here, but you got to imagine how many people go into a Chevy dealership end up realizing what a Camaro SS costs and the dealer's like, hey, for 5K more, if you don't really need those back seats, I can get you into a Corvette. Honestly, oh, yeah. I, th I think the I think the Corvette is the Corvette Grand Sport is better to drive than the the high dollar uh, ZL ones. You know, the sixty seventy thousand dollar Camaros. So I I would rather have a fifty five sixty thousand dollar Corvette Grand Sport with a manual and T tops, and I, it'd be a hell of a lot more fun than a ZL than you know a super serious ZL one. All right, so it sounds like. We have the solution. Um, Chevy has four years to implement this. They need to launch the mid-engine Corvette, take that up market, give the Camaro uh, not only more breathing room from like a horsepower and cost uh, pers perspective, but also change its, its mission from chasing cars around a track to uh, bodying up to the Challenger. And by that, we mean leaning into its muscle car persona going back to the drag strip um, and, and going back to that nostalgic emotional connection. And they have four years to do it. They could totally do it. And if they did that, I think the, the honestly, I think Ford would, would follow suit if Chevy did that. I think Ford would be like, oh, we don't, <laughs> we don't have to make the world's best sports car? All right, let's, uh, let's, let's make these, the, these, drag, the, these drag specials and these high horsepower, um, you know, really impressive, cars. Um, and all of that should give props to, to Dodge and SRT for striking this, this vein of, of interest and excitement that they did with the Challenger, specifically the Hellcat. Again, I, like I, I've said before, I hope somebody writes a book one day about what the product meetings were like when someone brought up the idea of the Hellcat, you know, and then the wide body and then, and then the demon and, and all of that. Like it was a genius uh, product planning move, and it has worked out, I think, better than even Dodge expected. So, um, so yeah, I, so I think we're all in agreement. The Camaro shouldn't go away. Um, there's plenty of life in it, and it can do a lot more than it's doing. They just need to kind of reorient its mission uh, a little bit and and let the the Corvette move out of its way, and all should be good. Come come 2023. All right, there were some other things that happened uh, this week in the auto industry that I wanted to talk about. Let's stick with GM because um, we got some news about the Colorado and Canyon, the Chevy Colorado midsize pickup and its um, sister truck, the GMC Canyon. Um, the news is that they won't be replaced until 2023. Um, again, GM with 2023. Must be a really important year for, <laughs> for GM. I found it a little curious because that seems like a long time from now. And these two trucks have already been out for a few years. Um, and it's also a, a fast growing segment. So why would you leave these trucks without a replacement for so long? That seems like a really long life cycle for them. Um, do, you, uh, do you agree, Greg, do you agree with me? Or do you think that it's a good enough product that it can keep going until then and they can evolve it and, and make it to that date, no problem? I feel like traditionally trucks have had really long life cycles. So, I mean, it is a long life cycle, but it doesn't seem 
that long. Look at the Frontier's been around since, what, 2005? The Tacoma's been fairly the same. I mean, I know it got like a upgrade not too long ago, but that was just an upgrade on the old chassis, kind of what it sounds like GM wants to do with these cars in 2023. The life cycles are long for mid-size trucks. I do not agree that the life cycles are long for full-size trucks. I would say they're actually rapid for full-size trucks. Not anymore, but um, traditionally they were. Since the 2000s, I'd say we've changed, but before that, these trucks lasted forever. I felt every time I turn around, there's either a refreshed or redesigned F-150 Ram and Silverado. Um, now, that might be because they have both their half tons and heavy duties, and they're like it, literally every year one of them is debuting like an all new version of one of those trucks. And um, also, those trucks but, just print money, so they have the means to consistently justify making changes at this point. Well, and the mid sized ones, frankly, don't print money. I mean, they sell well, but they're not selling anywhere near the full size numbers. And the margins are smaller, too, because they cost less to sell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the transaction prices are lower, yeah. so the profit margins are smaller. So, yeah, I think they kind of, they're, they're more like um, the other mainstream products that these brands have, where, where the trucks are just, you know, the trucks sell two, three times as much as, uh, as the other cars and, and, and SUVs in some cases. Um, what do you think, Brandon? What do you think, what do you think in particular about the, the current Colorado and Canyon? Are they good enough to make, to make it to 2023? I think they're better than Ranger. I think the thing that people forget about Ranger is that it's technically a much older product. It's just new to our market. Um, and I think it is competitive with, with Tacoma. Um, I'm curious what Nissan will do with Frontier, but right now that's not really a threat. I I don't see there being a ton of harm in GM deciding to keep these cars, these trucks around for another four years. Uh, I think the challenge for them is going to be keeping them fresh and keeping buyers interested in them. Uh, There there are a lot of ways that they can do that. Uh, GM has done a great job with the ZR2 and the ZR2 Bison. These are the only trucks in this class that are available with diesel engines. There's a Denali trim. I mean, these are talking, talking about, you know, contrasting these with, with what's happened with Camaro. It's, it's kind of an example of how GM, when, when they are enthusiastic about a product that they can really keep it, keep it going and make something that's competitive and engaging. And that does well with consumers. It's so I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think the reasons for keeping them around until 2023 are, are good ones it just uh it's going to be on them to keep the keep the products fresh um i'm I'm curious to see how they're going to do that though i was going to say i think you know adam smith the invisible hand of the market there's no real competition going on yeah there's the honda ridge line which is really good if you're willing to accept you know not as heavy payloads and a unibody chassis and the Jeep Gladiator, which is really new, but neither of those, the Jeep might end up being a big seller, but it's kind of expensive, and the Honda's never been a huge seller. Of the big sellers, you know, there's not a lot of change. They don't have a lot of incentive to make changes quickly. Right, I mean, it's really, of the big sellers, it's Tacoma and Colorado, I think, yeah. are the kind of runaway And Frontier. Uh, oh, oh, is the Frontier that sell that well? I mean, Frontier it's, it's does well. expensive than the others? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the Frontier well, a lot is a fleets, wild card. Though. A lot of, lot yeah, of fleets, though. That's probably the case, but it does it, well. If Nissan comes out with a redesigned Frontier that um, is really competitive, it could throw the whole segment into overdrive with the rest of them trying to update their trucks sooner than they had planned. But we'll, we'll have to wait until the Frontier comes, because uh, we've had zero... Um, like, I don't even think we've had spy shots of the new uh, Frontier. They've been very, very quiet about it. If there's one product at GM that I'm least concerned about, it's Colorado and Canyon. The, well, the next, uh, the next big piece of news that um, I, I was surprised to see because I didn't see this partnership um, coming is news that Lexus and Toyota will use a real wheel drive platform and an inline six cylinder engine from Mazda in their future vehicles. And the reason this caught me by surprise is because Mazda currently doesn't have those two things. Um, it's in their future product plans to have a rear wheel drive um, architecture for large sedans and an inline six, six cylinder engine, but they don't have them right now. So it sounds like once again, like Toyota hooked up with BMW on the Supra um, to, to glean as much as they could off the Z4 program that they're going to do the same with Mazda. Um, this definitely seems like a strategy. Lexus is uh, employing 
as much as they can to kind of uh, lift the cost off themselves for some of these new products they want to come out with in the future. Brandon, how does that strike you considering how the Supra came out and everybody had to kind of come to grips with, is this just a rebadged BMW or is it a, is it a real Toyota product? I mean, the, the, the main concern that I have with it is that the, you talk about Supra and you talk about uh, Toyota 86 and their partnership with, with it, its partnership with Subaru. Those are very low volume cars. These are, these are not, you know, big, big name vehicles. But if you look at that report, it says that the next gen, uh, Lexus RC and the LC and the IS and these these different vehicles these are these are high volume products. Um, well, I would I would argue that if it's a Le- if you're talking about a Lexus sedan, it's not a high volume product. Re- it really, um, maybe a Lexus crossover like an RX. Um, but I would point out that you know when when Toyota did have a partnership with Subaru to produce the Camry and some Subaru products at the same factory. Now, they yeah, but that really, was that was not really a technology share. share. Yeah, right. That was not right. technology was share. That was just a production agreement. But it was it was with I, it, it it was at least at a high volume level. I mean, you're pumping out Camrys. At, at, I'm 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 not ta- I'm not talking about you know the, the the means of producing it. I'm I'm talking about the actual identity of the car. You know, the Toyota can they can afford to sacrifice a little bit on these low volume products as long as they're good. And the eighty six is good by all accounts. I haven't driven it yet. I'm really eager to drive it. The Supra is very good. But do Toyota and Lexus risk losing some of their brand identity by farming out vehicles to such a degree? Mazda's cars drive fantastically, but Pepsi Challenge, you can tell the difference between a Mazda and a Toyota. I would it's, have it's, to it's believe, easy. though, if they were, if they were, I would have to believe if they were going to create a rear-wheel drive Toyota or Lexus off the same platform as a Mazda, like they wouldn't share any body panels. They wouldn't look. I'm not. I'm. I'm not similar. even saying that. I'm saying just the way that they drive. And I. I could be. Well, it would be. I an could be very. If mis- they drove like Mazdas. And you could. You could have said the same thing about driving like a BMW. But in, but by all accounts, the Supra is better than the Z4. It seems like this is something that Toyota is becoming a little little too reliant on. And if they're talking about doing it, this is a much larger scale than Supra or 86. These, these cars these cars are, and you look at it, it's RC, LC, and IS. That is, those are a lot of products. <laughs> I mean, they're it, a lot of products by number, but again, I don't think they're high volume like we're talking about. They're not Camry crossover high. Vo- they're not crossover high volume, but they're still, you know, a key part of the the Lexus identity. The the other concern that I have is that, you know, Toyota is one of the best engineering companies on the planet. They they build excellent excellent cars. It just strikes me as a little bit odd that they would they, they even think about farming things out in the first place. It, it's just a trend that I, I don't really know what the end goal is and saving money on low volume products at the risk of your your brand's equity doesn't doesn't strike me as a as a wise trade off. See, to me, I see it as I'm sure it does save the money. It has to. You know, there's multiple brands now or multiple companies working on this. But I also see it as Toyota being smart enough to realize what they don't know. And they say that's what great leaders do. They're investing their money on somebody who knows what to do so that their, the product can end up being great rather than trying to do it themselves, spending a bunch of money and creating a product that probably is not going to be as loved as, look at the current IS. The current IS is fine. It's not amazing. But I bet Mazda can make a better version of an IS. Yeah, I, 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 I can see that logic, but... I think if Toyota really thinks that it's selling itself short, I mean, nobody helped them with the um, with the Mark IV Supra, but it was awesome. You know, like they could have made another great Supra by themselves. I, they did it because of the money. They did it because they could do it cheaper, and 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 that's not a knock against them because I think they could also sell it cheaper, so it's it's better for the consumer. But um, but I agree with Brandon. I think they have the engineering and the manufacturing expertise to build amazing cars of almost any kind. Um, and yet they, they're turning to BMW for a sports car and an inline six, and they're turning to Mazda for a rear wheel drive platform and another engine. Um, 
you know, really, I think these are these are kind of bean counter decisions. Um, and I would say they're, they're better bean counter decisions than what we've seen a lot of American car companies do to save money. You know, we were just talking about GM. Um, it, it's probably better to do this than cut costs in, in other ways uh, by pulling out content or pulling out quality or, or, or killing, you know, um, um, whole car, you know, whole, whole car lines. Here, they're, they're bringing new car lines to, to market. They just are doing it in a way that's a lot more cost effective than if they did it on their own. Well, and I don't want to wash away the fact that the Mark IV Supra is great that you mentioned before, but history tends to make things, you know, look better when you're looking back. Romanticizes. Yeah, romanticizes. Perfect. Because the <laughs> the Mark IV Supra, when it came out, although fantastic, it was a little overweight and eventually it got super expensive. So okay. at the time... And it never even sold that well. Yeah. I mean, towards the end, that, they couldn't give the damn things away. You're right. Uh, I, I grant you that. However... The the inline six cylinder engine for the Supra, the Mark IV Supra, is legendary. It's legendary because Fast and the Furious said, "Oh, it's got a two no. JZ." No, it, it, I, that engine is like one of the strongest engines ever made. That that engine can handle like two thousand horsepower. Right, but like, the reason that the reason that engine and that car entered the popular lexicon is because of a movie. I know. I'm just saying that if if, if the Supra, if the Mark IV Supra isn't as good as we all remember if we're just looking at it with rose-colored glasses in the rearview mirror. Um, that may be true. Maybe it wasn't as great a car back then as, as I'm pitching it to be. However, Toyota knew how to build a world-class inline six-cylinder engine in the 90s. So, and they still make great V6 engines. I think, you know, what, right, something... But, but, they, but, <laughs> but they're going to two other car companies to, to get their inline six-cylinder engines when they've clearly demonstrated they know how to build a good one. I'm sure they'll have a lot of talks with Mazda about what they want out of an inline six engine because it seems like Mazda and Toyota are pretty close these days. Mazda hasn't even developed these two products yet. Like, why, <laughs> why, why is Toyota looking at Mazda as a source of a great inline six-cylinder engine? Um, I can see why they did BMW, like BMW's history. They have inline sixes laying around. But Mazda hasn't even developed this, so I would hope if I were Toyota that I would have a lot of input into its development uh, because, honestly, Toyota probably has more expertise building that type of engine than Mazda does. Well, I have a feeling Toyota's going to get more out of this than Mazda does because what is Mazda going to do? Make one vehicle from it, and Toyota sounds like they already have three vehicles <laughs> right. earmarked with this engine and chassis combination. It almost seems like having like Lotus come in and you know, tune your, you know, your chassis or whatever. It's a yeah. little more than that, but yeah. But how long? How long did? How long did Lotus make money doing that? You know, this is. I think we're we're forgetting that this could actually be a really good thing for Mazda. It could. This yeah, could. This could. could, this, could of... this could. I mean, the company has struggled with sales globally relative to other Japanese brands, and this could be the kind of thing that says, "Hey, you know, them saying to other Japanese automakers, saying, hey, we're really good at this sort of thing. We'll we'll do the mechanicals. You can do the rest of your stuff, but." You know, let us take care of it for you, and we'll get the platform and the engine and whatnot. But you get to slap your badge on it. Yeah, I mean, look at how yeah, Toyota's I, I, already actually, benefiting I, I, from I, it. The Mazda 2 here, which is the Toyota Yaris. Like, the old Yaris hatchback was this dud, and now we're getting the Yaris sedan and hatchback both being Mazda 2s, and they're probably some of the best in class of those small sedans and hatchbacks really ugly though really, really ugly, ugly but great to drive very comfortable yeah, fantastic to drive. yeah yeah you're right you're right um well that uh this has been a great discussion and we'd love to hear what everyone out there thinks about um this news the camaro the colorado and canyon and toyota using mazda um platforms and engines um, you can find us on facebook and twitter um, our handle is at motor one com and the discussion will also continue in the comments of all of these articles uh, that we publish on the site. Coming up next, we're going to find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, but beforehand, um, just a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Uh, so please hit the subscribe button so that you get our latest episodes every week. Welcome back. Uh, during this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week, and today we're going to start with you, Greg. What have you been driving this week? The 2019 Honda Passport, and uh, well, it's exactly what it looks like, a miniature pilot. Kind of good and kind of boring, but I was saying earlier, I think it was to you, John, what's amazing is how segments 
change cars because the pilot, although very good, is very mid-class among three rows because that's so competitive. Whereas in this two row segment, the Passport, which is mostly a pilot, drives a little lighter, steering feels a little bit heavier, it's a little taller, but it's gotta be near the top of the segment because there's just not a lot of great two rowers out there. I thought, man, everything around me looks like it was taken straight from the pilot. This really does feel like a two row version of the three row pilot. However, what Honda has done is they've made its kind of personality or or its, I don't know, uniform, more of an adventure vehicle rather than a family vehicle. So the, the suspension's a little firmer and um, it's, uh, it, it drives a little more sporty, but you feel like it's meant for somebody who's gonna go camping, whereas the uh, pilot, you know, the steering's super light and, and, the, and the, the suspension is tuned to be very comfortable. That's clearly designed for a family as, a, as an alternative to a minivan. Uh, and I think you're right, it could be more successful because it's in a less competitive segment, the, the mid-size crossover segment, than the pilot is in the full-size crossover segment that is crazy competitive. Um, so yeah, but overall I would say it's, it's, it, it probably scores near the top of the midsize segment where you're right, the, the pilot is kinda, kinda in the middle, maybe a little bit above average. Yeah, it's good, nothing wrong with it, it just doesn't stand out in that very competitive segment and among midsizers I can really only think the, you know, Forerunner if you're really obsessed with going off-road and want body on frame and Grand Cherokee if you're both want to go off-road and just like the Grand Cherokee it looks really good, but there's not a lot out there that I would take over this Passport, whereas I could give you a list of a couple cars that I would take over the Pilot. Right, right. All right, well, how about you, Brandon? What have you been driving this week? I've been driving the 2019 Ford Shelby Mustang GT350 or Ooh. Ford Mustang Shelby GT350 or whichever order the product planners have put those words in. Um, I... So I missed out on the Shelby when it first came out. Uh, the closest I got to the GT350 was a ride along with former Motor One uh, editor Steve Ewing. So this was my first time to really get behind it and get behind the wheel and see what it's all about. And I absolutely adore it. It is, it's, it's uncouth, it's obnoxious, it sounds absolutely fantastic. It's, it's a joy to drive. The only issue that I've come up come across with it is that the the steering doesn't offer much in the way of feedback, and that means a couple things. It, you can't really feel what the front tires are doing around turns, and you kind of get because it's a somewhat narrow. You you kind of get tossed around on uneven roads, especially if there's like a like a grooved road from a semi. It kind of just jumps from side to side. Yeah, tra it tram lines. So, but other, but other than those things, it's it's stupendous. I I it's easily one of the most engaging sports cars I've driven this year. I've I've absolutely adored the the week that I've had with it. I'm actually driving it to the Chelsea Proving Grounds tomorrow, which is about an hour and a half away, and it's it's going to be a good trip. It's uh, for those that don't know, it's a. 5.2 liter flat plane crank V8 that is the ideal sounding muscle car V8. It's yeah, it's one of the best sounding engines. If out there. if they could bottle and sell it, then Ford wouldn't need to build any more cars. Going along with our conversation uh, earlier about the Camaro, I think the Shelby Mustangs, both the GT350 and the GT500, and 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 other Mustangs like the Bullet, uh, that, that's where Ford has done a much better job than Chevy at making the Mustang both a good sports car, but also maintaining that emotional and nostalgic connection. I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the GT350 has both of those things. Like it has that, um, like the, the, the sound of the engine, the engine didn't have to sound that way for it to go fast, but they made it sound that way because it's hella cool, right? Well, and it's the, it's the other stuff that they did. It, it feels much more special than any other Mustang. There are unique body panels to a, to a degree that no, Camaro ever ever really got and people stop and take pictures of it and the one that I'm driving is it's blue and it's got twin white racing stripes and it's gotten a, it's gotten a ton of attention from people that of uh, people to a degree that I've never experienced in a Camaro 
it's 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 a lovable car. People people like this vehicle. They want to see it. They want to hear it. I've been doing my best to share the sound of it with the people of Detroit. Some of them <laughs> haven't been that pleased, but um, well, I think it's I, it's, it's a truly a, a, a wonderful wonderful muscle slash sports car. That's what I, I, I think. Chevy would lo- go on. John. Chevy would love to hear. Chevy would love to hear somebody say that about the Camaro. You know what you just said about the Mustang. Uh, and what I think people probably say about the Challenger in some similar terms is I just feel like people aren't saying those words about the Camaro. And that's the whole problem that has led them to considering discontinuing it. I've spent a fair amount of time with the GT350 and it is a fundamentally worse product than the Camaro. But some of the fundamental pro- flaws of it, like that tram lining, the brakes are really touchy, makes it oddly feel I so love, I special. Love the it, well, I, I like it too, but it's like, you know, if you were to, the tram lining too kind of gives it some specialness because the steering's so quick and very direct. And I always felt it was pretty feelsome, but it's things that honestly day in and day out would kind of be a pain, but it does make that car feel like you're in something. Like the Raptor does it too. They both just make you feel like you're in a car that was just very made to feel different in a good way you you want to know what my my biggest issue with it is that i cannot get this car in my driveway without scraping it yeah i believe it's, it. it's <laughs> i i got i was driving in a mclaren 720s spider last weekend and i scraped once the entire time mustang every single time wow wow well maybe it's, ford should call mclaren <laughs> well good thing they're supposedly making a mustang suv so you know Oh, let's yeah. Not. There you go. There you go. So, um, but no, it's it's great. It, I love it. Absolutely adore it. So, most of last week, I was driving the BMW X5 that I spoke about um, on the last podcast episode. But I also got a chance to um, drive a car I don't get to drive very often, which is my wife's car. My wife actually has a new Tesla Model Three. We went out in some errands, and we we drove over to my parents, which is you know like an hour away. I love it. It's hers. She, you know, so she she puts ninety percent of the miles on it. Something I've been kind of saying to people about why the the Model S or the Model Three is the way it is is that it's like all of the other automakers have been following these rules about how a car should be, and they're not written down anywhere. They just, you know, it's you know the 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 screen should look like this, and the controls should be this, and the and and everything should be put together this way. They've all been following these rules, and then a company like Tesla comes along, and either they didn't know these rules existed, or they just decided that they didn't care about them. And so instead of having controls in the interior, they just have a giant screen. And instead of putting mechanical bits under the hood like other current EVs do, they put everything under the floor. So there's a, there's a front trunk and, and a rear trunk. And there's all these little things about it that just seem to violate these unspoken rules that all these other cars have abided by. Now, some of them are really cool changes um, and innovations, and, and others of them don't work as well. The Model 3 being the third vehicle, I think there's more that works than doesn't work um, compared to like the Model S and the Model X and even going back to the Roadster. But it is it, when I get in to drive it, it is, it is unlike driving any other vehicle at all um, because of both how it drives and the interface of you and the car. You know, just the steering wheel and this, and this giant screen. Um, so it was really cool. And of course, I've been marveling at the range. My wife... Um, charges it about once a week. Um, and and even when she does charge it, it's still got plenty of miles left. Um, so the range has been for her has been uh, pretty amazing. She doesn't have a huge commute. I think it's 10 miles uh, one way, so about 20 miles a day. Uh, but so far, haven't had uh, haven't had been, haven't been in any situation where we've had where she's had range anxiety at all. So so yeah, have you guys driven Teslas at all yet? I haven't driven Model 3, but I've driven Teslas. I, I was curious, how's the build quality on your car? Overall, very good. Like, in terms of panel gaps, the panel gaps are all very good. Like, I don't know if you read that uh, article that Bob Lutz wrote about how he was impressed of, with the recent build quality of Teslas and their panel gaps. So that's good. There, there are a couple things from the factory that um, need to be fixed. Like, there's some, like, it's kind of like weather stripping around the doors that, that's bunched up and sticks out a little. And I haven't looked at it closely enough yet to figure out if I can just push it back in myself or if I need to call ser- the service for it. 
Also, there's a little piece of leather on one of the doors that looks like it got nicked at some point during manufacturing or something. So that's weird. I've never seen that like on a media vehicle for any other manufacturers. Those two things aside, um, I, I did a complete check of the car for the paint. Like I opened all the doors and, and made sure that like the, the paint color went into the door jams because that uh, was a problem early on. And, and the paint, you know, the whole thing's painted well. So I, w I would say overall better than I expected considering the reports from earlier Model 3 builds. It seems like they have, for the most part, dialed it in um, and are now just trying to figure out how to, you know, make as many as they can to, to meet the demands. So that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Greg on Twitter at TheFinker and Brandon on Twitter at Brandon Turkis. And lastly, me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, thank you, uh, you guys, for being here, my co-host this week. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And also thank you, everyone out there, for listening. And we'll see you next week.